Okay, our next uh, next speaker is Paul Butler. Paul Butler is a co-founder of me at Virginia Space. Uh, before that, he was a quant at Two Sigma and software engineer at Google. There we go. And he's going to be talking about uh, an open source project that we uh, recently released. Uh, and kind of tease is something that we were working on. Uh, at the time, we didn't actually have a name playing with the Hunter Spawner. Um, we decided to play roles off the tongue a bit better. So, uh, yeah, we, we, in the last couple of months, open sourced playing. And I'm just excited to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, so, if we go back to kind of forget about the browser, old school desktop applications, you kind of have your application. And I'm talking about applications that are, are dealing with large files. So things like an IDE that uh, you know, sits on a desktop, slurps up a bunch of files, has data structures and things like that in memory. Uh, things like a 3D editor that might scoop up a bunch of assets off of this, load a lot of that into memory. Um, video editors, uh, like we just saw. And data intensive tools, time series analysis tools, spreadsheets, all of that. So these are all types of applications that you that become really challenging when you try to move that into the browser because the browser just doesn't allocate that much RAM. Um, we run into all these problems if our if our approach is going to send all that data down to the browser because we have limited amount of network. Uh, there's just only so much a user willing to wait for that data to come down. If you're dealing with say 10 gigabytes of time series data or in the case of video editing, it could be hundreds of video editing. Uh, if you're running this thing on the cloud, there's egress costs to add up very quickly. Uh, and then there's just the limitations of the browser itself. So most browsers are going to have soft limits around two or three gigabytes. Uh, things like WebAssembly, WebAssembly is a very cheap bit system, so it just physically can't uh, address more than four gigabytes of data, uh, at least the version that runs in the browser. So, the natural thing that people kind of think is, okay, if you can't do stuff in the browser, you run the server. Um, that also runs into problems because the server is really an abstract concept, uh, especially at scale. The server is basically a horizontally scaled out series of servers that sit behind a load balancer. Um, and that load balancer is not a scheduler. The load balancer's job is to take the incoming network packets and hurry them off to one of the servers. It doesn't care about the CPU load on those servers generally, it doesn't care about the memory. You get a sophisticated load balancer, but it's still really not a scheduler and you can't really make it do the job of a scheduler. Um, so, the topic Taylor talked about last week, or last, uh, last one of these, was this idea of session backends. Um, this is not something we invented, but we had to come up with a name for it because nobody out there really had uh, a name for it that we could find. But this has been done. You can use things like Figma, GitHub Code Spaces, GitPod. Um, they basically have this concept where you open the application up in your browser and it spins up some process, process or container or uh, basically some, some unit that uh, lives on the server. And so there's, there's a couple of tricks that have to happen there. Um, it's scheduling that on a server, so it's making some decision about where this comes in a data center. Uh, it's setting up all the routing to that. There's a, another consideration is the number of complications that come up when you're dealing with this hiring. Um, and just kind of to bring it home, the idea here is that we have this uh, connection while the application is open, has a long lived connection to the server. In practice, that's a, a WebSocket connection. Um, and so this is where Plane comes in. This is Plane is ultimately solving this problem. Uh, so basically, the application says to Plane, I'd like a backend running my service, maybe a version of that service. And Plane says, back, your, your backend is JM2A or whatever. It's just a random string that's unique to this backend. It's, it's actually never recycled, so this will always be a unique backend. Over time, you'll have to give it a longer to actually, because you just have some backends. But, um, yeah, that's what Plane does. So really, the, the core things that Plane does is straight on this. Scheduling those backends on a cluster of servers. It's then routing traffic 
Um, so go back here to traffic to j3m2a.plane.dev. Use that road in both through DNS and through a proxy to the browser to maintain it with a spot. Um, and then it shuts down those back ends when connections are going. Uh, the idea with plane is you, you don't really need to deal with the architecture of it. Uh, let's see what he said, sure. Um, but this is, this is kind of how it works under the hood. So uh, this is sort of how the pieces talk to each other. There's a scheduler, a DNS server, live on kind of what we call the controller, which is a central brain of the system. And then the drones are kind of little worker nodes that are listening for back end requests, setting them up, doing some internal proxy, that sort of thing. Uh, it is open source, it might be licensed, it's a Rust code base. It's about a year of development effort so far, maybe a little bit more than that, I can have like a number of developers who are working on it, there's three of us now. Uh, we've been using it in production for about six months. Um, I'd say that we're, we're kind of powering things that are uh, maybe that demos or sort of betas for our customers, so it's a little bit, uh, you know, especially in early days, so you can sleep better at night knowing that they're not powering production systems. But, to us, you know, lately, we've been pretty comfortable with this in production. A uh, couple more use cases for this. So multiplayer collaboration, things like Figma style uh, application sharing or Figma uh, style collaboration become very easy because this backend is really just a hosting that can be shared between all of the clients. So your container that you spun up, your backend you spun up, can be kind of coordinating state among all of these clients. And then the last one I want to talk about is pixel streaming. And that's where we're actually running uh, an application or components of an application on the server and streaming back the raw pixels uh, compressed over WebRTC. And so this is kind of like, uh, like Stadia or Mighty. Um, I got to try to say because those are little things that have shut down recently, so it's like <laughs> bad examples maybe. But those are ones you guys know anyway. Um, so I want to show you uh, a quick demo of this. It, um, this is using Jamsocket. So Jamsocket is a managed version of Plane. Uh, this is using Jamsocket to start up Blender, the 3D software Blender, uh, running remotely um, and basically interacting with it from the browser. So the browser is capturing mouse events, uh, scrolling, that kind of thing, sending that back to the server. The server is forwarding that to the next server. Um, that next server is applying to the program. The program is doing stuff. And it's coming back, and this is all uh, GPU side right now. So this is something that's been, uh, been something we've been working a lot on is that server side GPU piece. Um, and I think I did it in time before the, the camera ran. Right <laughs> Any questions on that? Justin, are you doing uh, keyboard or something? Uh, that, that's a good question for Audi. We have uh -huh. yes. Yeah, come on. So Avi was the one mostly behind the letter as well. That's a question. Standard brain. Uh, do we forward keyboard with this? Okay. We actually forward uh, anything. So this, uh, the, we use uh, Guacamole's library for uh, keyboard mouse forwarding. Um, so that handles the fact that different browsers, for some reason, have different responses to different key ones and some other stuff. Um, but yeah, we do, we do follow keyboard events. I was actually wondering, like, so there is an API for like getting raw um, key codes from the, from, from like HID events, but that only works on Chrome, so. Cool. Um, does Plane provide a primitive for resuming, like suspending and resuming a uh, created session backend? Yeah, so the question was, does Plane provide a way to resume a session backend? Uh, currently, no. It's something we're very interested in. Um, I find with, right now we're, we're mostly focused on the next containers, which, uh, because they have such a big interface with the system, um, there are people building stuff like Cryo and, and that kind of thing that, um, that deals with that. There's just a lot of edge cases. If you go in either direction, uh, towards like WebAssembly or towards uh, KVM, there's, I think, more robust snapshotting in, in both of those scenarios. Um, so we have an eye on, on both of those, but it's kind of a trade-off where like, doing something in GPU, uh, which is being, I would say, where we're more interested in than, than kind of pure compute, 
Um, with the GPU, there's, there's also the GPU state to worry about, and there's um, GPU virtualization is a total other thing. So um, I would say that, that's been kind of on the back burner. It's very interesting from a computer science point of view. It's not something people ask for that much. Um, so that's, that's been interesting. Do, do they not have to ask for it because usually they just spin up a new one? Like exactly, yeah. So, yeah. so they'll just spin up, uh, spin up a new container. So the, I think where, where we'll probably end up kind of dealing with things is basically the, the, the contract will be whatever you put on disk, you can expect to be there next time, but your process is going to start from, from fresh. Are there? Uh, is there a way to Yeah, so the question is, um, could this be a Kubernetes uh, thing? We actually, uh, the first two versions of Plane, uh, before it was called Plane, were Kubernetes based. Um, the reason we moved away from that, and we actually, it's like, there's Kubernetes involved in the stack here from what you're saying, but we moved away from actually using Kubernetes for the drones because what we found was that the things that we cared about were different from what Kubernetes cared about. Um, Kubernetes is very concerned with kind of replicating your services, making sure there's always one running, starting them up. Uh, we're just concerned about starting them very fast. Like we just, like, you'll see when this starts. It is it, as fast as a process on your machine. Um, so because we care about that, we want to own it end to end from scheduling to events that go through the system, uh, even to being able to do some things in advance of uh, starting a container so that uh, so that most of the work is done off um, Right now, that's things like uh, all the DNS writing and, and certificates are managed in advance, but moving towards even having the pit namespace ready and the network namespace ready, basically just dropping a container into an environment to get set up for it, um, which is it, what we find with Kubernetes is like, it's possible to do all that stuff, but you end up erasing so much of Kubernetes that it doesn't, it's not worth the complexity anymore. They live in the back end. So what is like the difference between this with like, you know, like Unreal Engine has like you have human creators go time, so like takes up streaming service where you create things on your server? Yeah, I, I think Unreal Unreal has a pixel streaming service. This is kind of a general purpose. Um, you know, you can run any any graphical X11 program right now down the road with and other things. Uh, but actually what's really exciting to us is not so much it's just an entire application. It's what you can do if that becomes, you know, if, you, if this is a React component, and then you keep all the UI local um, and composite in pixel streams stuff from the server. Uh, yeah, cool. And does this mean that someone else could connect and see the exact same graphic? So the question is, can someone else see this? Yes, but the controls get mixed up. So we, we intentionally, you know, we, we're not reinventing the desktop layer here um, to, to allow multiple cursors. So there's other people doing that. Um, it's not really interesting to discuss. All right, I should, uh, I should call up the time, but I will be around after this. Um, so you can ask me questions.